Excellent. So, so that's the question. Again, why exactly, what's the connection of Hanukkah to Yosef? And we started this week, you know, with Joseph having his dreams and uh, we see some favoritism. And the question is, you know, is there any kind of connection uh, there with the story of Hanukkah? So Rechaim Shmulevitz actually starts off uh, an incredible essay where he de- describes this. And, and he basically describes that in the Talmud, right, <clears throat> in the Gemara, the, the Talmud asks, why exactly, on what basis did the rabbis decide to enact this holiday called Hanukkah? Right? We know that this holiday is a rabbinic holiday. It's not mandated in the Torah. It happened way after <clears throat> the period of the, the Torah. What's the basis for this holiday? And the Talmud goes on to explain that the basis of the holiday is that when the Greeks entered into the sanctuary, they defiled all of the jugs of oil that were meant for the menorah, the holy, uh, you know, seven-pronged menorah. And when the Chashmonayim, the, the, the band of brothers, the, the, the Jewish army, when they overcame them, they checked in, in the temple and they couldn't find except one cup, uh, one jug of oil. That's all they found, which was uh, still had the intact seal of the high priest. And it was only meant to last for one day, says the Talmud. But a miracle happened and it lasted for eight nights. And that is the basis for why we have a holiday called Hanukkah which, you know, presumably we're aware of that story. We know we light eight candles to commemorate this. But there's another interesting piece here that Rav Chaim Shmulevitz points out. And he says the following. He says that when you think about it, right, at this time, the Jewish people were in grave spiritual danger. And we actually mentioned, right, if you would open up a a sitter, which I'm sorry I didn't do. I didn't uh, bring a sitter with me right now. But if you open up the sitter, Right, we have the special prayer we say three times a day. We insert it into the Shmona Esrei, into our prayer, three times a day, uh, called Al Hanisim. And in Al Hanisim, what do we talk about? What do we invoke? It's very interesting. You could go look up in your sitter. We invoke the the actual uh, the the threat that when the Greek army, the Greek nation, rose up against the Jewish people to make us forget our Torah. And to drive us away, God performed miracles for us, and the the brave and mighty were delivered into the hands of the weak. The many were delivered into the hands of the few, and the the liturgy goes on describing the nature of the miracle uh, in more of the military sense that that the the Jewish people held off this massive army, and God delivered them into our hands. <clears throat> so you see it interestingly. When we pray and we thank God in the actual prayers on Hanukkah, we don't talk about this little jug of oil lasting eight nights. We talk about the miraculous military uh, victories that the, the Hasmoneans had, that the Maccabees had. And Rabbi Chaim Shalot says, you know, why is that? You know, why did the rabbis make this uh, holiday based off of the miracle of the oil when... We're, we're praising God in our prayers for the m- military victory. And when you think about it, I mean, I guess they're both quite impressive, but it's hard to imagine like this little band of like yeshiva boys, you know, beating a mighty army. I think it's arguable that this might be even more beyond the scope of our imagination. You know, it might be arguably a, a more impressive miracle, you know, if we had to rate, you know, both. Although I, I suppose that is uh, debatable. So why the focus, when the rabbis made the holiday, why the focus on, on, on the jug of oil? And that's where we, Rabbi Chaim Shmulevitz in his piece, brings in this week's Parsha, right? So if you open up the Chumash, um, if you want to reference it later, and, and this Chumash is actually on page 205, it's uh, chapter 37, verse uh, let me find the verse. Yes. Um, this is verse 20. Uh, where is it? I'm sorry. Um, verse 25. It's very interesting. Joseph's brothers trick him. They strip him of his tunic, the Torah tells us. They took him and they throw him into a pit, which was empty. 
and there was no water in it. The Torah then tells us in verse 25 the following. <clears throat> it says, they sat to eat food. They raised their eyes and they saw, behold, a caravan, a caravan of Ishmaelites was coming from Gilad. Their camels were bearing spices, balsam, and lotus on their way to bring them down to Egypt. So it's, it's interesting. The Torah tells us this group of Arab you know, merchants, basically, are coming down. Ultimately, they're going to find Joseph. They're going to carry him down to Egypt, where he's sold as a slave. Now, there's a very interesting fact that we just need to point out, which is the, the Torah doesn't mince its words. Every word in the Torah, every phrase in the Torah is there purposefully, is there you know, for a reason, and there's no extra words in the Torah. So what is meant... What are we meant to learn from this? What are we meant to gain from knowing that this caravan of Ishmaelites happened to be carrying these spices? Like, what is the Torah trying to teach us? So Rashi fills us in here, and Rashi tells us, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to, to find it. Um, he, says, he says, why does the Torah publicize what they carried? And he says, it's to show us the reward for the righteous, that it was not the way of the Arab merchants. Usually all they would carry would be, you know, oil or fuel, which had a foul smell to it. And this was meant to show that from heaven, from God himself, you know, that he didn't want the Yosef to be harmed by this bitter smell. That's a puzzling Rashi, very puzzling. What are we supposed to make out of this? You think that Joseph in this moment of misery in his life, where everything he knew until now is uh, thrown up into smoke, uh, you know, raised by his holy father uh, with very much, with a great deal of love. And now suddenly he's being cast off like a slave, sold into Egypt. And somehow it's supposed to feel better because now, oh, it smells nice. Oh, great. It smells nice. I feel great. It's kind of like, if God forbid, I would get arrested and, you know, as I'm being hauled off to the, you know, to the prison or where I'm getting booked, well, at least it smells nice in the police car. So I can, uh, there's that, you know, there's that, there's comfort in that. Like, what is the, what is the message here? What is Rashi telling us? And Rabbi Shmulevitz asks this question. He says, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. In this lowly point in his life, <laughs> everything is going up into dark, uh, into smoke at this point of intense darkness uh, and concealment in his life, what does it matter to Joseph is what he says. And he says the following, right? He says specifically at the moment when his entire world was crumbling before him, was being destroyed. That's specifically when Yosef could have come to the situation of what we call yeyush, of despair, God forbid. And he says, presumably... You know, uh, it seemed it probably seemed to him like God was completely eliminated from his life, that uh, completely closed off to him, and that Yosef was lost or forgotten. God forbid. It would be very easy for Yosef to think that. It'd be very understandable and natural for him to think that. And so says says uh, Rabbi Shmulevitz, specifically at that most difficult point in his life. God had this miracle, this tiny little miracle that would be imperceivable to most, where something slightly was off, where God demonstrated to him and he showed him that he was still with him and that he's not lost and that he should never lose hope, God forbid. And he prepared this nice smell for him, uh, which was not a natural thing. It shouldn't have been that nice smelling to demonstrate to him that he specifically was not lost. And specifically in that moment of darkness was when he needed it the most. And therefore, he says that we see from this miracle that happened to Yosef, it wasn't, it wasn't the miracle. The point of the miracle wasn't just to eliminate the bitter smell from the caravan. He says it's rather to show him uh, to, to hold on and to, and, and to strengthen himself, to know that God was with him even in this uh, most difficult point of his life, and that he was not lost. And no matter what, you know, uh, God still loved him, was with him, and never forgot about him. And he, he relates that the same 
is true, and this maybe answers our question regarding, you know, the question we started with, Hanukkah. Why do we have Hanukkah? You know, arguably the bigger miracle again is this band of yeshiva boys holding off this massive, powerful army. But that's not why the rabbis chose to enact this holiday, to make this holiday specifically in the darkest time of year, when we specifically light the menorah and, and, and you know, show the beautiful light in the darkest of times. He describes that this miracle of the oil, right, for those, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting as I've learned more and I've learned more about Jewish law, it didn't really matter, you know, in that moment, like we didn't need it to last eight nights. Meaning we didn't even need it to last one night. We could have started reproducing the oil, had it, you know, stamped by the Kohen and just started over in eight days from now, you know, or however long it took to produce the new oil. Like it was totally unnecessary. And yet this unnecessary miracle is what the rabbis chose to enact this holiday for. And so Rabbi Chaim Shmuel says that the point is, again, that we're not focusing on the very essential, necessary military victory that the Hasmoneans at the Maccabees had. It was beautiful and we would thank God for it. But when they enacted this holiday in the dead of the winter and in, in the height of darkness, the holiday was enacted so that we can remember this unnecessary miracle that God bestowed for the Jewish people. And he describes it in very beautiful words. He says that sometimes the point of a miracle is not just to, you know, to, to produce for us this massive deliverance from some horrible situation. And now we're like free. That happens. That does happen. Those type of miracles. Sometimes miracles happen. He says <clears throat> to just reveal God's light to us. Uh, and he says, and these are his words to give us a nishika. Those Hebrew speakers, a nishika is a kiss. It's almost as if God is giving a kiss on our head from above to show that he loves us and he cares for us. And, and that is something that we always have to remember that we can never never forget uh, is God's intense love for us, um, even in the most difficult uh, moments. And that is what he says, that the rabbis chose to enact when making a uh, this, this holiday it wasn't to focus on the salvation of the jewish people but rather to show how beloved we were to god even in the darkest of times even when things are so challenging to let us to remind us that we're never lost uh, he's never forsaken us which is why when joseph went down to egypt that little tiny thing the little nice smell was the same idea uh, it was not a huge deal in the grand scheme of things just like the oil wasn't but it was, it was the same message to show that God was deeply involved in this, that he loved him, he didn't forsake him, he never gave up on him. And that was the message of, uh, of both the miracle of the oil and the miracle of the nice smell that the Arab merchants were carrying in their caravan, those nice spices. And I think for us, perhaps, you know, it's something to consider in our own lives. Now, a lot of times we're not privy to, you know, massive miracles. Uh, we don't really see these days, you know, open, revealed, you know, mirac miracles. But all of us do experience more of the concealed type of miracles. And on Hanukkah, it's really our job to sharpen our antenna to, uh, to notice them, right? If you have waves, uh, radio waves, we know that scientists can tell us that radio waves are a real thing. They're, I don't know exactly how it works. They're flying through the air. Um, but unless you have some sort of like in fancy antenna, uh, it's not going to give off any sort of perceptible sound. So our job now is to sharpen our antenna to absorb and process those miracles that happen in our own lives. And, you know, so I think that part of our job on, on Hanukkah is to work on that. You know, it may be every night when we light the candles to reflect on, on a miracle that might have gone unnoticed, if not for our heightened sensitivity uh, this time of year. And, one last thing again that I wanted to close with is this idea of like a kiss from above from God, that sometimes we're struggling with things, we're having a hard time, but there's one little uh, shine, shine of light, ray of light, one little ray of light to encourage us, to tell us, you know, keep going. You're doing great. I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. And I just, uh, just an interesting story I'll close with that um, uh, it was like seven or eight years ago, I was studying the Daf Yomi, one page of Talmud a day. 
and you know every seven and a half years you finish the entire cycle i never finished it yet i am starting again this new cycle as of this past january still holding on for dear life hoping i can do it but one morning in albany new york i was uh i was studying the chapter about shabbos uh, the second chapter where it talks about the candle lights interestingly enough that's the chapter in the Talmud that deals with Hanukkah, the story of Hanukkah and the lights of the menorah. And I'm sitting there on a freezing morning in Albany, like every morning was, and I'm sitting you know, in, my dine, in my living room and I'm reading from my iPad, uh, which you know, looks like this. You know? So I, I had uh, chapter two introduction. And I was reading the introduction to the second chapter. And this is what I read. Okay, I'm just gonna word for word read this. And I thought to myself, <clears throat> like I'm kind of thinking now to myself when I'm doing that, Fiomi, does it really matter? You go so fast. What am I gaining? I wake up so early. Maybe I should stop. These were the thoughts I was having. And this was the experience I had that morning, specifically when I had those thoughts. Quote, this is the art school's introduction from the iPad. The rabbis decreed that one must kindle a lamp before Shabbos in order that he conduct his Shabbos meal in a lighted room. They base this enactment on the prophet's proclamation that you proclaim Shabbos a delight, the holy of Hashem, the honored one. From here, the rabbis derive two requirements. One, to enjoy Shabbos. We have to delight in Shabbos, experience it, have some wine, have some meat, enjoy our lives. Uh, and two is to honor it. We dress up nicely for it, etc. The mitzvah of enjoying Shabbos is called Oneg Shabbos, delight in Shabbos. Some maintain that lighting the Shabbos lights for the Shabbos meal fulfills the Oneg Shabbos. Okay, now at this point in my reading, everything goes dark. Everything goes dark at this, at this uh, point of, uh, of my learning session. Total blackout. And I'm sitting there, conveniently, it was still dark, it was like 5.30 in the morning, but I had this fancy schmancy, I'm sorry, uh, illuminated iPad, okay? And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I can keep learning because my iPad is charged and I, you know, it's lit up. And these are the, I'm not making this up. These are the next words that I read. Now I'm literally like, my finger was like pointing at the thing. I'm not making this up. So it's now dark in my house, pitch black. And he says, some maintain that kindling lights for the Shabbos. Um, I'm sorry. No, no, no. It, I'm sorry. Forget what I just said. Here's what was the next words that, that I read. It is difficult for someone to enjoy Shabbos when his house is dark and he cannot see where he is going or what he is eating. Those were literally like the next words. So it gets dark. I'm wondering, should I do this or not? The next thing I read is it is hard to enjoy Shabbos when your house is dark and you can't see where you're going. It was like this subtle little sign. Was this like an open miracle? No, probably not. Um, but do I think it was a kiss from God telling me, good job. You know, it's, it's dark, it's hard, it's difficult, but you're doing great. I'm proud of you. I'm with you. Keep going. Uh, it was that little kiss on the head, that encouragement. And I think in, uh, for all of us, again, now is perhaps a, a time as we approach Hanukkah to think about that for ourselves. Have we had those moments of uh, God kind of peeling back a layer for us uh, to experience him, to get encouraged? Uh, do we have those moments where we can sharpen our senses to savor and cherish and appreciate the miracles uh, that we do see uh, in our own lives. So God willing, as we approach Hanukkah Thursday night, we light the candles. We can, uh, you know, grasp onto the, the, the literal light and the spiritual light and, uh, and, and uh, see the world from a different lens uh, and appreciate the miraculous nature, um, you know, the, the miraculous things that happen to us every single day. So, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's, I guess, the first message I just wanted to point out. And then, God willing, I think there's going to be another session. We have to just finalize that date. Um, but again, for those who joined us a little late, I, I recorded this. So we'll try to uh, disseminate this to everybody, this recording. And uh, again, it's, it's a brand new concept and kind of like self-study uh, on your own, different uh, links. And you can listen to classes. There's a nice array of classes and uh, articles and things to read. So we hope you enjoy it. We hope... Uh, have a beautiful, beautiful Hanukkah, and it was a pleasure to, to see you and to have you uh, join us tonight. Thank, Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi.